Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, on behalf of uh, Ambassador Dick Solomon, I would like to welcome you to the U.S. Institute of Peace in this conference on a very important subject, the prevention of violent conflict. Um, Ambassador Solomon sends his regrets. He's stuck in the notorious Washington traffic, but he hopes to, to be here in about five minutes, uh, five minutes or so. And uh, he asked us to, to proceed, and then he will join us as soon as he gets here. Um, this, of course, uh, conference, as I said, focuses on an important subject. The, we'll have three panels um, today. Uh, one will take us on a tour de réseau across the globe, highlighting the potential conflicts that are at risk of breaking out and the unique dynamics affecting the conflict prevention efforts in each region. Uh, since the world is increasingly defined by global issues that transcend borders, we'll have a second panel which will look at critical cross-cutting challenges, uh, the global economic system, governance, and non-proliferation of nuclear weapons. And we'll also have a panel on global conflict prevention initiatives hearing about these ongoing efforts by the State Department, the EU, the UN, and civil society groups should help us identify the critical gaps and an action agenda going forward. And we're also, of course, pleased that the conference will conclude with a tribute to uh, Dr. David Hamburg. Nice to see you, David. Um, uh, and uh, Ambassador Solomon, of course, will will give some remarks uh, at that tribute to, to David at the end of the conference. And my apologies for uh, being a little late. Tara and uh, Mary have reminded us about uh, President Kennedy's speech uh, 50 years ago at the American University. He announced the establishment of the Peace Corps on that occasion. And uh, uh, we're still working at building those institutions. And I want to comment uh, very briefly uh, before we get uh, into today's events about what this institution is trying to do uh, in the service of preventing, managing, and resolving uh, violent, uh, violent conflicts. Uh, and Mary has uh, touched on some of the key, key themes, uh, but I want to uh, say that I think you're probably aware that this institution, which uh, when it was created a quarter of a century ago, was... Uh, it had a great, very broad mission from Congress, but the, the world was such, it wasn't clear where, where the Institute of Peace would go, how it could function in a world which was still in the middle of the Cold War. And uh, we've had the opportunity and the privilege in many ways of following the end of the Cold War to be, a, to be able to take our very broad congressional mandate uh, and to build some activities designed to deal with conflict. And when I first came here, the buzzword was uh, conflict resolution. And I said, that, that seems to me a little narrow. I think we've got to broaden it and think about prevention, management, and resolution uh, as a much more inclusive approach to dealing with, with our mission. And uh, during that period, it's turned out that uh, it's the last phase that really has... Uh, focused our efforts and accounted for the growth of the Institute. Uh, Dick Holbrook negotiated the, uh, uh, the Dayton Accords to try to stabilize the situation in the Balkans, but then, frankly, the State Department didn't have certain capabilities and, and institutions for dealing with it. The, the example I'd like to give was we all know that uh, the conflict in the Balkans was driven by religious and ethnic uh, tensions and, and uh, hostilities. Well, the State Department does not have a Bureau of Religious Affairs, and it hadn't been uh, structured to deal uh, with the kinds of ethnic conflicts that were uh, emerging after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, well, we did have a program in religion and peacemaking, and we got our analytical folks and academics out of their offices into the Balkans, and they did some very good work uh, helping the different ethnic and religious communities in the Balkans organize themselves uh, to try to promote uh, reconciliation. And 
on it, it went from there where because we were small, because we had this broad charter from Congress, we were able to do some innovative things. General Tony Zinni called me about the same time and said, I've got these war fighters, uh, my Marines, but the uh, Clinton administration is sending them around the world on peacekeeping missions. Would you help us retrain them? So suddenly we had an opportunity again to take our broad mission and start to do things that, uh, given where we're headed uh, now, the size of, of this institution and the fact that we are uh, within a year going to be uh, permanently located down uh, opposite the State Department and staring at the Lincoln Memorial uh, will, I think, have a have more certainly more visibility and hopefully more positive impact uh, on the way that this uh, country deals with uh, with conflicts. Uh, Mary mentioned the issue of training and uh, looking ahead to our role, particularly when we're across the street from the State Department. Uh, this institution should be a change agent for the way that we approach the management of international conflict. And uh, uh, one of the things that we will embed in our work there is an academy for international conflict uh, management and peace building. It's a training program. It will be small. It's not meant to rival the Foreign Service Institute or the training that gets done uh, at the National uh, Defense University, uh, but it is a way of trying to innovate uh, in the training of skills that are, frankly, up to da up till now, not part of the, the toolkit, the role conception of the Foreign Service officer. And one of the things that uh, we look for as we build the institutions that Mary was talking about uh, is not just bureaucratic uh, reorganization, uh, but training the way uh, our Foreign Service folks will deal with the ethnic and religious problems that uh, are endemic in so many parts of the world. And this, to my mind, is one of the great opportunities uh, that the Institute of Peace uh, brings to our work. And finally, let me just say that uh, as we have looked at the problem of uh, dealing with conflicts, uh, looked at organizational issues, and I think you may be aware that uh, building on the great work that uh, David Hamburg did, his uh, really unique and path-breaking a commission on Preventing Deadly Violence. Uh, we had uh, former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright and former Defense Secretary Bill Cohen do a, a commission on, on genocide prevention. And they again recommended certain organizational changes. But the core of the issue, in my view, is the problem of political will. That we can get early warning. We can or reorganize certain aspects of the government, but unless we can change the way we think about managing conflict, uh, unless we can somehow operationalize the insight that we all recognize when we look at uh, conflict situations, we all know that preventive action is cheaper in money, it's cheaper in saving lives, but somehow uh, generating the action <laughs> and a lot of this relates to Congress authorizing or appropriating money, uh, as well as administrations deciding that they will commit, in many ways, troops. I mean, in the Rwandan case, there was a recognition. If we had sent in a small number of troops on a multilateral basis, we probably could have prevented the genocide, but it, it didn't happen. And over and over again, we can find examples of uh, genocidal violence, deadly violence, against civilians on a broad scale where nothing is really done until after the blood is flowing. And so figuring out the ways to generate political will in some ways is the, the capstone of this effort uh, to effectively uh, deal with, uh, with preventive approaches to managing conflict. Well, again, we're really delighted that uh, you're all here today. We're due credit to uh, Abby Williams, who's the director of our Center uh, for Conflict Analysis and uh, Preventive Action. Uh, we've had an over overflow uh, uh, turnout of, of folks here. It's clear we need a bigger facility, and uh, within, a, <laughs> within a year we'll be in one. And uh, let me just conclude by saying I'm really uh, delighted that David Hamburg is with us today. We do want to give recognition that 
the conclusion of this session for all that he has done for, uh, for leadership in this, this area of activity. So again, thank you all for coming, and uh, I know you're going to have a very creative day. And Mary, thank you. Thank you all very much. I understand, panelists, we're also speaking to a live webcast and a number of people in some overflow rooms. So we thank you very much, all of you, for your participation. Um, my name is Mark Grossman. I have the easiest job today, which is to uh, chair this panel um, with these five uh, speakers. I just thought I'd make a couple of comments by way uh, of introduction. Uh, first of all, I thought it was very interesting um, in the first hour or so to hear Harold Nicholson's classic work, Diplomacy, Abby, um, brought together somehow with the national security strategy of the United States of America. And although I suspect that these two books would not be in anybody's book club uh, over the next few months, um, as I was thinking about this during the break, there are actually quite a lot of very interesting lessons um, from Harold Nicholson's diplomacy that apply to the questions of the national security strategy, and I think to this uh, panel as well. And I recognize Nicholson's book is old, and there are no minorities as diplomats, and there are women as diplomats. But the idea of simultaneity, the idea that who we choose as our diplomats matters, and very importantly, as Dick Solomon just said, how what kind of professional education we give to our diplomats is also extremely important. And I thought that a lot of the themes that Nicholson hit on in some ways came through uh, in this national security strategy, and I thought it was a very good way um, to get the day started. As I say, I've got an easy job, um, which is, first of all, to also honor David Hamburg. Thank you very much for being here. We're honored to be in your presence. To thank you all for this uh, opportunity, and then to introduce this panel uh, on regional challenges. And I think that uh, for me, you all have the bios of all of the people um, who are here, so I won't take up uh, any time um, in that regard. Um, but we have people who are going to focus in on the questions, not just of the region, but also how it relates to the questions of conflict prevention. And the conflict prevention aspect of this, very well defined, primary prevention, the unique challenges and opportunities associated with preventing the initial onset of large-scale violent conflict. And that's what we're interested in talking to you about in these presentations, and I hope then we'll form the discussion uh, that we have going forward. Our plan as a panel is a pretty simple one. Uh, I am going to ask each of the panelists to speak for between five and seven minutes, and we're going to go just um, right down uh, the way it's listed in your program. Uh, then I thought we might just, among us, uh, have a conversation for a few minutes uh, and then open this up to what I hope will not will be questions and answers, yes, but also a conversation among all of us uh, that will focus in on a number of topics, but primarily, primarily so that there's outcome here to think about what it is that USIP can do going forward uh, in light of some of the things that we will hear about uh, in, these, uh, in, 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 the, in the panels. And so um, that's our plan. Uh, I want to bring this to a close uh, right at 12.15. I know that uh, people's time is valuable. Uh, and so without any further ado, I would ask uh, Mark Bellamy, our friend from the National Defense University now, to come and lead us off and talk, talk about Africa. Mark, Thank please. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Usually Africa is the, the last to present. The fact that I'm being first today, I don't know if that's ominous or a good sign. A, uh, um, I will... Um, I'll do my best to keep within the six-minute time limit. I know that Mark is going to be a, uh, a, a very strict timekeeper. If I accelerate as I'm going through, you'll know that it's because I fear that red card. Um, it's hard to know which countries in Africa um, or which conflicts in Africa pose the greatest risk of large-scale violence uh, in the near, near future, in part because the list, uh, the list of potential candidates is so long. Um, I've narrowed it down to what might be called the, uh, the African Big Three, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about those three particular countries, uh, although this is not a definitive priority list. I'm sure other, other countries could and, and probably should, uh, should be on the list. Uh, I think from the U.S. policymaker perspective, uh, the greatest concerns in Africa today uh, is the greatest concerns are first uh, the Sudan, uh, where a referendum early next year will almost certainly result in the secession of southern Sudan and the establishment there of a new and extraordinarily fragile uh, independent state. 
There are a number of plausible scenarios between now and that referendum in January that could trigger a large-scale violence. Uh, there is an even larger number of plausible scenarios um, following that referendum, post-referendum scenarios, uh, that point to a possible resumption of civil war in the Sudan. And these are all risks uh, that are clearly visible to us today. Second uh, priority concern is the Democratic uh, Republic of the Congo, uh, DRC. And here, too, uh, the risks are clearly visible. President Joseph Kabila uh, of the Congo uh, does not have a popular base of support. He lacks the institutional or the financial means uh, to carry out his authoritarian agenda. Local rebellions and insurgencies, many of them fueled by outside interests, fester everywhere in the DRC. A collapse of state authority throughout much of the Democratic Republic of the Congo and a return to widespread ethnic, tribal, or uh, militia-based violence uh, is a plausible medium-term scenario. In the third case I cite, that of Nigeria, uh, the risks are, are, are not as obvious as in Sudan or in the DRC, but the stakes are just as high. Nigeria's 100, uh, 150 million people are split by ethnic and religious and religious antagonisms, but they are united in their resentment uh, over corruption and misrule from Abuja. The potential for violence careening out of control in the Niger Delta or along the ethnic and religious fault lines of central Nigeria uh, is heightened by the government's reliance on heavy-handed military repression to deal with protest and unrest. Fallout from sustained large-scale violence in, in any of these three countries will quickly spread across regional borders. A resumption of civil war in the Sudan will generate significant civilian casualties, large population displacements, calls for international humanitarian intervention, and possibly calls for U.S. military intervention, at least on humanitarian grounds. Neighboring countries, especially those supportive of southern Sudanese independence, may well be drawn into the conflict. A breakdown of order in the DRC will further intensify armed competition throughout the eastern Congo, creating pressure for renewed intervention by Rwanda, Uganda, and possibly other nations' forces. An already deplorable humanitarian situation will worsen, generating renewed calls for international intervention. Should the Nigerian government lose control in areas of the Niger Delta for any sustained period of time, significant disruptions to global oil supplies will ensue until alternative sources are found. Given Nigeria's size and economic importance, a breakdown of authority there will put all neighboring governments under increased strain. More generally, large-scale violence in resource-rich nations, such as the DRC and Nigeria, invites non-state actors, including international crime networks, to expand their reach and activities. This is already a significant problem in many areas of the mineral-rich DRC and in Nigeria, the Nigeria Delta, the Niger Delta, where by some estimates, $60 million of oil production each day is siphoned off, is siphoned off and marketed illegally. Uh, what are the challenges to effective conflict, conflict prevention in Africa? There are many. Uh, I would argue that the most significant is the inability or the unwillingness of African governments to first admit that there's a problem or that there's a risk, and when a risk is admitted, to accept responsibility for managing it. In the three cases I've mentioned, governments have historic, historically done more to exacerbate risks than they have to mitigate them. And we can perhaps talk a little bit about this in the discussion that follows, but uh, my, my point would be that these ruling regimes, all to one degree or another, have a stake in perpetuating social divisions and uh, at least some degree of lawlessness, not in their capitals, not in their central areas of central control, but in the peripheries where their control is weak. In terms of what the United States can do to reduce risks in countries like Sudan, uh, Nigeria, or the DRC, I think a first step would be to assess to what degree the incumbent governments are the largest part or a major part of the problem, and from there determine whether and how we intend to confront those governments. Uh, it's not as simple as it sounds. We, the international community, have known for a long time that the Kabila administration's attempts to build an authoritarian edifice without the means to do so are a formula for disaster in a country as fragile and divided as the DRC. 
and yet the donors who continue to foot the bill for 50 percent of the Kabila government's budget have largely fallen silent. They appear intimidated by the Kabila government's resurgent nationalism and its resistance to international tutelage. By continuing to underwrite a government whose policies it deplores, the international community may be contributing rather than diminishing the risk, contributing to rather than diminishing the risk of large-scale violence. So we need to, determine not, need to determine not only the extent to which governments are the source of the problem, but the extent to which we, uh, either through uh, possibly through acts of omission, are accomplices to that. A second point uh, is that conflict prevention in Africa requires the coordination of external actors so that we are all saying the same thing to governments, to opposition groups, to rebels, to other actors. I mean, this is widely understood as a principle, uh, but it is not consistently, consistently acted upon. Over time, the coordination problem has become more acute due to the proliferation of external influences. China's emergence as a major force in Africa is one factor, but so is the emerging role of, of nations like Brazil and India. Sovereign wealth funds, or on the dark side, uh, unregulated or illegal companies or criminal syndicates that are working with weak and vulnerable but still sovereign governments. So governments in Khartoum, Abuja, uh, Kinshasa, uh, today have many more potential partners and benefactors to whom they can turn to, uh, to whom they can turn in times of in times of difficulty. This decreases our leverage and requires that we redouble our efforts to create consistent international pressure. Uh, despite these challenges, there have been recent cases where uh, concerted international uh, diplomatic effort has worked. Uh, I won't, we can maybe talk a little bit about those. Kenya in 2008 was rescued from the brink of truly large-scale uh, violence and chaos. Uh, Guinea uh, last year was uh, rescued from a, 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 a military coup that was threatening to spiral out of control. Uh, in both of these cases, unpopular governments were caught between a very disciplined and very effective broad-based international diplomatic effort on one side and a large block of domestic political opinion on the other. They didn't have much room for maneuver. They didn't have, they didn't have many places to go. Um, these two interventions uh, that, I, that, uh, that we, we may want to talk about uh, were strongly supported by the United States and other major donors, but they were African-led. And this brings me to my final final point. Um, while the U.S. can and should play a catalytic role in steering diplomatic coalitions in the future to resolve or to, to prevent uh, uh, large-scale violence uh, in, in Africa, it will inevitably be Africans, African, African leaders and African governments will play the lead role. Uh, that's not bad news. That's actually probably good news. Uh, there are a number of reasons to think that the uh, African Union and African sub-regional organizations are, in fact, stepping up to this task and have been doing so over the past 10 years. Uh, finally, I, I'd say that if, if we want to play a more proactive role, perhaps one of the best things we can do is try to reinforce that willingness, reinforce those, cap those nascent capabilities, work more with African regional institutions to ensure they are capable of playing that leadership, uh, that leadership role. I'll... Uh, I'll leave it there and, and look forward to our discussion. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is John Park, and I work at CAP uh, looking at Northeast Asia. And this morning I wanted to raise uh, the ongoing dilemma of dealing with North Korea. And North Korea has been on the headlines and been in research topics as a priority for a long period of time. And the challenge is always to raise attention to North Korea and why it's a priority now. You'll hear that phrase over and over again in the literature, a lot of policy statements. If you go back to think tank reports from the mid-1990s and also congressional testimony, there's a consistent theme that North Korea is on the brink of collapse. And so sometimes I feel like the boy who's crying wolf, but you know, with those refrains, this time I think there is a serious aspect. Uh, is the collapse imminent? I would talk about North Korea from the aspect of risk, and the risk management and risk analysis aspect is something that CAP does uh, quite closely. With the first uh, question that we are looking at, this whole notion of uh, what is the greatest risk of outbreak of violent conflict, large-scale violent conflict uh, in the region. In my region, Northeast Asia, North Korea has changed dramatically in recent months, and I would highlight one point which I think is quite uh, significant. March 26, North Korea sank a South Korean warship called the Chunan. Why is that important? For over a decade, North Korea was seen as weak, as a country that was on the brink of collapse because of a decrepit economy, 
country that engaged in nuclear weapons development, but for bargaining. Basically, the threat assessment about North Korea was of a weak state collapsing and the countries having to pick up the pieces. March 26 was different in the sense that you had North Korea carrying out this attack and the sinking of the Chunan. Now North Korea is seen as a clear and present danger in a conventional military sense. And the countries, and specifically South Korea and the United States, through the context of their alliance, are responding uh, in that manner. That is creating a certain reaction, feeding into reaction cycle that is currently happening right now. Uh, from the Chinese perspective, certainly they've been monitoring and dealing with the situation very closely. But the way that they've been responding to the U.S.-South Korean alliance response, again, the cycle of reaction feeding into reaction, which merits uh, careful monitoring. All of this is happening in the context of change internally as well in North Korea. So the confluence of external and internal change in North Korea is somewhat unprecedented. Usually it's one or the other. Right now, something that was hypo uh, hypothetical, uh, Kim Jong-il's brother-in-law, Chang zong tae becoming the regent and many believing to be the orchestrator of the succession process, eventually the reins of power being handed over to Kim Jong-il's third son, Kim Jong-un, that process is underway. The hypothetical of, Kim, of uh, Chang zong tae as the regent of this process has now become a reality. But that leads to a dilemma of what do we know about Chang zong tae What do we know about this leadership succession process? What do we know about North Korean nuclear decision making in this leadership process, especially as Kim Jong-il is ailing? All of these questions, I think, lead to a confluence of risks uh, that are multiplying and something that, again, has to be monitored. Can we jump to the conclusion that something is imminent? I think that is still early to, to tell, but certainly we have to engage in these type of discussions within intergovernment, but also uh, within the different groups that are dealing with this issue here in the United States as well as out in Asia. If we address the second question of what are the likely consequences of not only one but two new conflicts merging together, for Northeast Asia it's particularly difficult because there are no regional institutions. Uh, we have relied on alliances, different types of growing economic integration activities, uh, announcements and developments of free trade arrangements and so forth. The greatest danger, I think, in the region is the fog of what the countries will do in a period of rapid and sudden instability in North Korea. And why is this the fog? I would uh, highlight four particular areas. One is the uh, real strong notion that the border between North Korea and China is something that is understood with an existing North Korea. If North Korea were to collapse, if there were to be sudden instability in North Korea, and the other countries would feel that their national interests were, were to be at stake. I think there's a high degree of probability that you would have countries implementing policies that are geared specifically to that, their national uh, security and policies. And the borders in this instance are only recognized between North Korea and China. So in the event of rapid collapse of North Korea, this whole notion of what that border means, I think, will come into play. The second issue uh, of the concern area are the troops. Which troops would be involved in a, in a situation of sudden instability in North Korea? This all has a direct correlation to the whole notion of preventing violent conflict because <coughs> in talking about these issues and what the indicators are and the signposts are, I think there's an ability to at least get on something of the same page. It'll be difficult to be exactly on the same part of the page, but certainly that is a priority right now. The third notion of what the missions will be, uh, clarification of this point, uh, this point will be critical as well because if we look at what the countries are looking to achieve, their goals are all different in the short term, in the medium term, and the long term. Already we're seeing some reaction from the Chinese side, and their concern is not related specifically to North Korea. And I would highlight that China, in looking at a lot of their activities and engaging in discussions with Chinese counterparts, you see a Chinese reaction right now that focuses on their concern about what they see as an expansion of the U.S.-South Korean alliance, the area of coverage. Already the Chinese are conducting what they view as something within their rights, and that's a live fire exercise on their coastal uh, waters in an area that would abut the areas where the U.S. Uh, South Korean naval exercises would occur, most likely sometime this month. Let me move to the third part of the challenges that we face in effective conflict prevention. If these are the dangers and these are the risks that we're monitoring right now. The challenge is, is how to address these uh, growing gaps. And, and the idea of the maps, as everyone has a different map in terms of the policy challenges uh, that are uh, really faced by all the countries related to the very quickly evolving situation in North Korea. And also these differences in goals. We don't really know why the countries have specific motives and how they're changing, which points to all the, uh, all the more in the challenge of uh, the need to have these Track 1.5 dialogues. Uh, track 1.5, a quick word there, is uh, something that is different from Track 2 in the sense that we are engaging a lot of government officials in these dialogues. Uh, the Institute has been running uh, recurring dialogues with counterparts in China, 
and with uh, Japan and South Korea. Uh, and the notion of having these recurring dialogues is very important because we're able to monitor how the different countries are changing in their perception of signposts uh, in this situation right now. The last point I, uh, point I wanted to uh, mention is the notion of what the U.S. government can do right now in uh, reducing the risk of a uh, new conflict uh, breaking out in the Korean Peninsula. First and foremost, uh, the United States uh, successively has laid out different priorities, uh, some consistent, others that have changed according to how the situation is evolving. But there has been a gap in terms of the engagement mechanism. And this isn't really a function of the government per se, but I think institutes like USIP, where through these Track 1.5 dialogues, we would be able to have this recurring engagement with partners out in the region. The final point th uh, that I'd like to raise is that within this, as we look at the three elements today of the principles, policies, and practice, as it relates to Northeast Asia and preventing conflict, uh, the three operational aspects of convening, mapping, and capacity building are priorities uh, right now. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I'm Nick Vozdev, and uh, one of the things I was struck by Ambassador uh, Yates' speech this morning is she gave a pretty good and compelling reason why it's not contradictory for someone from a war college to be coming to an institute of peace to talk about conflict resolution. We're seeing how this convergence is occurring uh, in, uh, in the United States and in the circles of government. Uh, my brief today is to, to give you an overview of the sources of conflict uh, in the Eurasian and European space. So I'll give you a general framework now, and then in the discussion we can get into greater specifics depending on what you'd like to, to focus on. First, looking at the sources of conflict uh, in this area, we can look at three general drivers that we need to continue to address. The first is what I would call unsettled geography. That is, that even though we have borders on maps, uh, that there are still lingering questions about how those borders are drawn. Ethnic groups aren't satisfied. Minority groups within borders don't like how borders were drawn. Uh, but it goes beyond just simply the ethnic issues. It has to do with resources, with control of water, strategic minerals, and the like. Uh, someone uh, might have drawn a map and split uh, control of a key resource, and now that uh, resources are becoming scarce or there's competition, uh, groups may want to revisit uh, how those uh, resources have been apportioned. So the first is we still have these geographic questions. We have essentially, certainly in the, in the post-Soviet space, the imposition of arbitrary borders from the Soviet period. Uh, but even, of course, uh, in Europe as a whole, the Versailles settlement and the like, uh, more or less accepted. But when you have a period of tension uh, and you have increasing competition and you perhaps have economic hard times coming after a period of prosperity, you may have unsettled geographic issues arising in other parts of the continent. The second, and this is probably the most profound in the former Soviet space, is that many of the countries do not have stable mechanisms for political transitions. That is, they do not have uh, accepted rules of the game for how power is transferred, for what happens to winners and losers. And if you have a situation where politics is zero sum and people who are now in power figure that if they lose power, they lose everything, that creates the basis for conflict. If you don't have a system for how you regulate the transition of governments so that, uh, you know, if you, for example, take a look at the case of Georgia, Mikhail Saakashvili would be an interesting test case. Will he be the first president of post-Soviet Georgia to actually finish his term in office and turn power over to a successor? Because his two previous predecessors did not have that uh, opportunity. They were uh, removed in extra-constitutional fashions. You have the question of succession in places, certainly in Kazakhstan uh, or in Uzbekistan, where uh, the leader who was there at the time of the Soviet collapse is still there. And the question is, well, what happens when you have a death or uh, incapacity? And so that can be a driver for conflict. And then finally, uh, the reality of this area is that uh, these countries don't always get to control their own destinies. Outside powers are involved. You have spillover from other conflicts, from other issues that uh, then have an impact on what happens. So what we've seen in Kyrgyzstan over the last two months shows that all of these factors have been in play. 
we have ethnic tensions, we have resource tensions over land and water and division of economic assets. Uh, we've had two governments that were overthrown in the last five years where there was no mechanism for transition. We've had the disruptions from ongoing conflicts in Afghanistan. We have the involvement and interest in meddling of outside powers, uh, Russia, the United States, China, and other players in the area. So all of these things have come together in Kyrgyzstan. All these factors are present there and what makes it uh, difficult uh, uh, to resolve. When we look at uh, future trouble spots where conflicts may arise, uh, first and foremost throughout this area, it may be for low-level violence, not massive uh, uh, outbreaks of, of violence, but uh, the reality is, is that uh, throughout the European and Eurasian space, questions of immigration, national identity, the cohesiveness of the nation-state versus uh, demands of regions for greater autonomy, uh, you may see the resumption of low-level violent uh, campaigns. Uh, generally, the uh, ability to cap down these conflicts have been as long as economic times are good, as we've certainly seen in places like Northern Ireland. If the economy is doing well, people have less incentive for violence, but if the economic crisis continues, uh, we may see the resumption of uh, a conflict in, in some of these areas. We have the trouble spots, the Fergana Valley in Central Asia, uh, particularly with what happens with water uh, resources there. Uh, the Caucasus may be quiet, but it's certainly not resolved, and we do not see uh, much movement, if any at all, with any of those conflicts. And then when you consider the continuing uh, presence of uh, armed formations and large numbers of small arms and the like, it's uh, it's definitely a tinderbox that all it takes is a spark to restart. Uh, the Balkans, again, uh, the Dayton Accords and other things froze conflicts. They stopped immediate conflicts, but they did not provide uh, long-term mechanisms for uh, reconciliation. Uh, the willingness, again, of the European Union and others to continue to fund, uh, to buy off conflicts, essentially, uh, by providing large amounts of aid. How long can this continue in the, in the state that the European Union may find itself in economically? Uh, and as the European Union has begun to withdraw and disengage from the Eurasian space, uh, that uh, leaves, uh, opens the possibility of a resumption there. Uh, finally, I would add just as another area of zone is the Arctic uh, as a zone of conflict, as the uh, ice melts, as resources open up, uh, as uh, demand for resources increases, uh, you may see the uh, possibility of conflict uh, picking up there. The good news is, is that this area of the world has relatively well-established mechanisms for resolution. Uh, there are a lot of incentives in place in many of these areas for people to try to avoid uh, conflicts. The bad news is, or the, the areas of concern that I would see here, uh, is that uh, much of our emphasis over the last two decades, particularly again in the post-Soviet space, was on freezing conflicts. We wanted to stop violence. We wanted to stop people from being killed. We froze things, but we didn't necessarily have in place the mechanisms that would lead for resolution. Now that we're starting to see some of these conflicts thaw out, the risk that simply freezing a conflict and hoping that it will go away over time uh, is not uh, a long-term strategy. Uh, we may need to be revisiting, uh, particularly in some of these areas that we're not going to be able to prevent conflicts from breaking out, but the prophylactic measures that we'll need to make sure that a conflict doesn't spread, in essence creating areas where uh, conflict may rage, it may not be solved, and we're trying to create uh, zones around it uh, to prevent, uh, just as we do with fires, wildfires in California, you let the fire burn itself out and make sure it doesn't spread in the hills. Uh, Three things just to conclude with uh, in looking towards the future uh, that may require some changes in policy or may require us to, to reconceive of things. I certainly believe that the principle of the Helsinki Accords, which is you do not allow for border changes by violence, that has to be a principle that's upheld. We've often, however, translated that to mean that there can be no border changes, no territorial adjustment at all. And I think we may need to revisit the question not of using violence or allowing people who have engaged in violence to change borders, uh, but to have uh, to encourage countries to come together in uh, regions and broke away regions to come together and perhaps open up the possibility 
that there can be revisions of the territorial settlements, that the Stalinist territorial settlement in the Soviet Union, the Versailles plus territorial settlements in, in other parts of Europe might be open to revision through negotiation, and I would really stress that. We're not saying we're just going to recognize what you were able to seize 20 or 30 years ago in a frozen conflict and we're just going to live with it. The question about encouraging stakeholders to, to perhaps be open to that idea. Uh, the second thing, of course, is uh, in uh, conflict resolution, conflict prevention modes of trying to build up greater stakeholders uh, in transitions. That is, that uh, moving away from people thinking that you have zero-sum uh, political outcomes, that uh, if there's a change, they risk losing everything, which then causes them to, to sort of say, well, it's better to, to keep what we have and to keep it frozen rather than to even admit the possibility of a, a potential settlement if you think you might lose out. Uh, finally, uh, and this is uh, more for the realm of uh, in the security uh, area. For this part, uh, we had a lot of emphasis in the 1990s on NATO being the primary provider of security. Uh, the rise of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization in the Eurasian space raises the question of thinking forward about whether or not there needs to be more of a relationship between Brussels and uh, the Shanghai grouping in terms of thinking about joint missions, joint operations uh, for this part of the world. Uh, not thinking of it as NATO will go in and solve it, uh, but that NATO reaching out and perhaps having a much more institutionalized relationship with the SCO than it's had up to this point. Uh, so those would be the three areas where I think we may need to think more for the 21st century on this issue. And with that, uh, not to take any more time, I'll stop there. Morning. Uh, I'm up here to provide a breather, a short break or an interlude, uh, because there's nothing of urgency that I really have to talk about in Latin America. So everybody can relax now. Uh, hope no one gets up and goes out and starts texting. But uh, uh, basically, uh, uh, Latin America just is not threatened by the kinds of uh, situations, crises that we've heard in the other regions. Uh, in fact, uh, last year, as many of you know, uh, the region was, uh, including the U.S. policy, in, in, was consumed by Honduras, and uh, it became known as the Honduran crisis, the crisis of Honduras. And uh, we use that very frequently until at a board meeting, one of my board members who is not associated with Latin America particularly said, crisis? You call that a crisis? <laughs> and that's true. I mean, there was very no bloodshed virtually at all in, in, involved. There was uh, certainly uh, military was involved very quickly. And, uh, but in any event, uh, I think that, that Latin America does differ from the other regions we're going to we've heard about today, it has just very few conflicts uh, of the kind we've been talking about, either interstate or internal struggles over power, authority, territory, what have you. Uh, the last interstate war in Latin America uh, was over very, very quickly. It occurred in 1995, and indeed, uh, the two presidents of Peru and Ecuador uh, were here at the uh, Institute of Peace uh, in a joint pro program with the Inter-American Dialogue uh, uh, to sort of celebrate their peacemaking. Uh, so uh, it was a very interesting. Uh, um, and uh, internal wars in Latin America, there's been some of those. Uh, the most the, uh, publicized ones uh, were mostly resolved for Central America and Nicaragua, and, uh, El Salvador and Guatemala, which had U.S. involvement, were settled or largely settled in the 1990s. People from both sides now participate in government. There's been changes of government from uh, one side to the other side of the conflicts. There are guerrillas in power now in two of the f uh, five Central American countries. Um, one major conflict does remain uh, 
in Colombia, uh, where uh, the government faces actually two uh, guerrilla armies. Um, but, uh, you know, that's a war that the government is clearly winning. Uh, there's little question with considerable assistance from the United States. Uh, almost every Colombian feels greater security today than almost any time previously, and certainly over the past eight or ten years, it's really been a remarkable change, and it's not surprising that uh, uh, the uh, current president is uh, uh, the person who uh, most uh, sort of associated with the current president was easily elected with some 70 percent of the vote because the people do see real strong and deep improvements in the country. And what had been a deep ideological battle that occasionally seemed to actually threaten the government is now basically over territory and control of the narcotics trade more than it is over uh, great ideology or, or the, the, the potential for assuming any kind of power. Outside of Colombia, there's occasional guerrillas in uh, Peru now and old Sendero Luminoso, the Shining Path, uh, but not very much more than that. Uh, the dangers of interstate conflict, uh, I would suggest there's probably only one serious uh, danger right now. It's possibly between Venezuela and Colombia. I don't think that will happen uh, because of any intentional acts on either side. Uh, I think if could occur because of some pushing and shoving. I frankly also don't think it's very likely. Uh, the source, if there is any, is, the, you know, Venezuela seems, and I, I suspect they, they are convinced uh, or they've convinced themselves that the U.S. wants a change in the Venezuelan regime. Uh, and at least they have some evidence to back that up, and uh, we'll do it through Colombia, that Colombia will be the instrument, and this has put the Venezuelans on some alert. Uh, the Colombians, and I think they probably have a better case to make, uh, see Venezuela as assisting uh, the guerrillas, and uh, with the danger... Uh, basically that uh, they're going to prolong the war in Colombia. Not that uh, that's the big danger of that more than anything is just that by providing refuge, access to arms, access to more money, that this can be con uh, continued. Um, and uh, But I still think on the end that this will remain below the threshold of really having a, uh, a any kind of interstate uh, uh, warfare. Um, let me say there's also been some concern in Latin America about an arms race over recent years, and there has been some expenditures. I think it's been overblown, frankly, as does this, what is the Swedish Institute of Strategic Studies that sort of suggests that as well. I'd be happy to talk about that, but I wanted to move on to, uh, to be able to uh, complete this in the time allotted. So, uh, I'll be happy to talk about arms races. Uh, one thing that is important, though, despite the lack of the kind of interstate or internal conflicts we've heard so much about, uh, there is, it's not a region at peace by any means, uh, Latin America. Indeed, it's uh, literally one of the most violent places on the globe, if one includes uh, sort of criminal activity, sort of domestic, not domestic, internal violence, not domestic violence in the way we use the term. Um, let me just give you a few numbers and then I'll, uh, six out of the ten countries with the highest homicide rates in the world are in Latin America. Um, and uh, so are nine out of 15 and 17 out of 30 Latin American and Caribbean countries are among the most violent in the world. Mexico, incidentally, which we hear so much about the violence, is only 17th in the world. Uh, so there's uh, quite a number of uh, Latin American countries that are uh, more violent than, 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 uh, uh, than, uh, than Mexico. And uh, just to give you some comparative, in Western Europe, there are 1.5 homicides uh, I guess it's per 100,000 people. I, I'm, I'm not sure what the denominator is. But 
In the USA, the number is six per 100,000. In Honduras, uh, it's 60, uh, some 10 times the U.S., uh, 40 times Western Europe. Brazil, it's 26, uh, uh, which is uh, four and a half uh, times uh, the United States per capita. And Mexico, it's something like 10, which is quite a bit below Brazil, interestingly, even though we, we hear most of the violence about Mexico. And uh, let me say, I think also this is violence that is not sort of just, well, it happens. It happened in New York and happens in Chicago. And, uh, but it really is uh, threatening to political stability in many countries, certainly to democratic stability. The rule of law is and it's not so much in a place like Mexico. I think Mexico is uh, badly shaken up by it. It's having tremendous impacts politically. But it's really that the smaller countries of Central America and the Caribbean, that uh, the dangers are much greater. They just don't have the institutions, the resources to deal uh, with this. And... Um, Again, uh, you know, the, the, the amount of violence, corruption, and also the kind of nasty backlash against crime that has its own uh, problems uh, emerges. And uh, let me ju just say that um, if Mexico is somehow successful, you're going to see just 15 other countries in the immediate area just – uh, inundated with the crime and violence as well. So you have a, a problem that it's not, you can't deal with it in any single country. You really have to deal with it, and I could go more into that. Let me just say that on the whole, though, that there is no good way that I've seen so far of dealing with this. There really, I mean, we're watching in Mexico where there's now a terrific internal debate about how to, manage the crime and violence? Was it right to really sort of launch a full-scale campaign to try to deal with the drug trafficking and other criminal activity, or was that a mistake and it's better to sort of live with uh, sort of this infection and the corruption that occurs and sort of, but, you know, you feel less threatened than you have. Uh, uh, and this is a debate that's playing out uh, I think that it's playing out a bit in our own drug policy in Latin America, which is obviously associated with this criminal. But I think this is one area that if I had to suggest that from my very uh, uh, per parochial perspective that uh, would be worth the Institute taking on is precisely this crime and violence. I think it's really as threatening in, in many respects as the, the, some of the civil wars were once in Central America, for example. I don't, I don't think there's any question. Let me just uh, – do I have two more minutes? No, I don't have two more minutes. <laughs> I do, but I'm going to take one. <laughs> Let me just say I, I want to say a little about lessons. But uh, one of the things that occurred to me, though, is shouldn't Latin America then be sort of a – play more of a global role in this sort of – Peace. I mean, here's a region that has avoided the kinds of conflicts that is so uh, brutalized so much of the world. And can Latin America play more of an international role? And the fact is, it's it's there's a big question about that. And, and but I think it's worth examining on issues like nonproliferation. Uh, we have the Brazil-Turkey uh, negotiation with Iran, which I'm not sure was terribly helpful, but. The fact is that they were engaged on that issue, and could that be turned toward more constructive? Similarly, peacekeeping, they've done an extraordinary job in Haiti. Uh, Uruguay has more peacekeepers per uh, capita than almost any country in the world. Again, that's another. And then support for multilateral institutions. Uh, one thing, that Latin America has probably more multilateral institutions per square inch than anybody else. But again, it might be something that to think about. Thank you. Thanks. It's always a pleasure for me to speak at the USIP. And I, I think it's the 
third event that I speak at the past few weeks, all overflows, and I'm beginning to think this is a conspiracy by Dick Solomon to heighten the anticipation for the new building, <laughs> badly needed. Uh, I also would like to acknowledge uh, David Hamburg, who just stepped out, but uh, who has contributed so much to uh, uh, research on, on uh, conflict prevention. Um, before I focus on the main issue that I want to talk about, which is the uh, dangers, urgency, and, and consequences that uh, are related to the Arab-Israeli issue specifically, I'd like to just give a, a little bit of a, an overview of some of the intermediate uh, issues that we have to pay attention to, even though we're not so much focused on, and also some of the ongoing conflicts. But I will uh, uh, mostly talk about the Arab-Israeli issue. First, uh, the water issue in the Middle East. It, it's a major issue that we're not really focused on. Today there is an Arab a, a meeting in Cairo, uh, among, a ministerial meeting of, of Arab states, to deal with the water issue, the very big issue of conflict between uh, uh, Egypt and, and uh, uh, neighboring states and, and, and also states along the Nile uh, uh, for, for about the waters of the, the Nile. Uh, we know this is a big issue in uh, uh, the negotiations between Israel and the Arab states, particularly Israel and the Palestinians. It's a big issue for Syria, Iraq, and and, and Turkey, and, and, and th that's a looming issue uh, that cannot be uh, underestimated that we have to pay attention to. Uh, the issue of refugees, even separate from the Arab-Israel issue as such, uh, uh, we, we've seen what happened in Lebanon, demonstrations by Palestinian refugees that have been marginalized. Uh, that is a, a big issue uh, potentially in Lebanon. Uh, the Iraqi refugees, refugees are really uh, often the seeds of future conflict, uh, uh, the Iraqi war has produced refugees in, in Syria and, and, and Jordan. We need to pay attention to that. Uh, those are issues that uh, could flare up uh, in, in not, not so much tomorrow, but, but in the intermediate period. The delicate balance within Lebanon itself, the Lebanon, domestic Lebanon issue is not fully settled. Uh, there is a, a, a relatively stable short-term environment, but that could flare up because there are so much uh, a, a – um, uh, instability in the in the structure of the system that could produce uh, internal conflict uh, and, and that that will inevitably be consequential for uh, for neighboring states. There is a, a another issue that I think uh, uh, comes out of the Iraq War, which I call a a major change in the distribution of regional power that is destabilizing and that we have to pay attention to. There is a sense of marginalization of the Arab states at the expense of non-Arab states with the rise of the role of Turkey in the region, uh, the, the rise of the power of Iran, uh, the sense that Israel is also empowered, the sense that the Arabs are not uh, carrying their weight in regional affairs. Uh, that leads to competition uh, and an environment that is destabilizing that we have to pay attention to. Uh, there are two uh, immediate ongoing conflicts that uh, obviously could escalate any time. The Yemen uh, conflict uh, between the Houthis and, and the government uh, and between North and South that is uh, potentially uh, uh, destabilizing not only internally, but uh, those can also draw in Saudi Arabia and, and Iran. Uh, there's the Iraq environment, which obviously remains unstable, and in the next year could actually become more urgent, particularly uh, as uh, the U.S. Uh, completes its uh, withdrawal of its uh, uh, combat forces, uh, and uh, if, in fact, we, uh, the, the, the uh, different uh, sects do not come together in the formation of an effective government, even with an effective government, the, the absence of effective uh, provision of services that, that has been <coughs> visible in Iraq could become a, a potential problem. Obviously, Iraq will remain an issue that is consequential for the region. But there's nothing in my judgment that is more urgent, more consequential than the Arab-Israeli conflict, and particularly the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. <coughs> I think we're running against a, a, a really a very short timeline, uh, and I think the next year is going to be absolutely <coughs> critical uh, uh, for uh, on, a, on a variety of dimensions, and I'd like to, to focus on those dimensions. The first dimension uh, is really we're coming toward the end of the line on the two-state solution. Uh, I, I think there is a disbelief. Uh, in, in the region that it, it is going to happen. Um, my public opinion polls show that uh, 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 half of the population no longer believe it's possible at all, ever. And, and, and that's, I think, increasing. I expect that by, by the day. And so we have a disbelief. 
we have an environment that is untenable. Uh, and, and clearly, even in the West Bank, before we talk about Gaza and Hamas, uh, I think an environment where, although there's some economic improvement and stability, is still not a natural environment. And, and I think that uh, the only what's holding it together is not the economic prosperity. That's something that is uh, uh, good. There is not, by the way, economic prosperity. We're talking about it in comparison to what it was a few years ago or in comparison to Hamas is an improvement. Uh, but it is not a sustainable environment. It's still an environment of occupation. And I think that if we don't have uh, some uh, breakthrough in, in, uh, in the coming year, uh, I think we're facing the prospect of a third intifada. Uh, uh, I think that is not something to be underestimated. Uh, in, and, and we know what the consequences would be, not only for Israel and the Palestinians, but, uh, but for the region and the U.S. Uh, Gaza is, uh, the situation in Gaza is untenable. It's simply untenable. Uh, and I'm talking about, in part, of course, the humanitarian situation there, uh, that is just not sustainable. Uh, but beyond the humanitarian situation, I think the role of Hamas is unsustainable. Uh, the fact that Hamas is not shooting right now uh, is not a natural uh, uh, situation for Hamas. I think what's, what's holding it together is not so much deterrence, although that obviously is a factor, the Israeli deterrence, but rather the belief that they still are going to be able to play some role in an unfolding mediation environment where conflict resolution may become possible. So they, they still are holding some hope that something's going to happen in which they're going to play a role. If that disappears, uh, there's no doubt that they'll start shooting, and we know what that will entail in terms of, uh, of Israeli uh, responses and, and, and actions and escalation. Um, Israel versus Hamas, uh, versus Hezbollah in, in Lebanon. Uh, I think in the short term, I do not expect... Uh, that either one of them has an interest in starting a conflict. Uh, uh, for a variety of reasons, both sides are not anxious to start a conflict. But that situation is highly unstable. Uh, a single incident uh, uh, could create a crisis that would lead to escalation uh, that will go out of control. And so I think that um, uh, the Hamas, the Hezbollah issue remains a big issue uh, in the relationship with Israel uh, and I think that uh, while I, it's, it's, it's unlikely that, in a, you know, that, that either side is going to decide to wage war against the other in the foreseeable future, it, it, it's, there, there are a number of scenarios that one can draw that can uh, create an environment where one can anticipate conflict, an open conflict. Uh, Israel versus Iran. Um, I think that the international sanctions may buy a little bit of time. Israelis are divided among themselves of whether it's wise or unwise for Israel to wage war on Iran. In some ways, uh, the, the sanctions on Iran may increase uh, the likelihood that some people who want to wage war on Iran preemptively uh, uh, will, will voice uh, uh, the need to, to carry it out, in, in part because I think the, the, there is a sense that uh, the sanctions themselves will not reduce Iran's ability uh, to pursue its, its nuclear program. Uh, and so for that reason, I think this is something uh, that uh, uh, certainly is, is possible that we have to be particularly uh, mindful of. I think it would not be in Israel's interest to wage war against Iran. I don't think it would be in America's interest for Israel to wage war against Iran. But I think it is a real scenario that we have to watch for and we have to try to uh, prevent. Um, finally, I just want to mention uh, the uh, conflict within Israel itself. Uh, there is a, a changing environment within Israel that we have to be careful about. Um, uh, there is an escalation of rhetoric between uh, government officials uh, uh, and, and people, uh, uh, coalitions on the right, and the, the Arab population in particular, the citizen, Arab citizens of Israel, Palestinian citizens of Israel, it's escalated in the past uh, few months, particularly uh, when this government came to office. Uh, both sides have, have been engaged in um, a, a, a language that has uh, fueled a, a, a dynamic that is dis, uh, destabilizing. Um, within Israel itself, uh, 
there's changed in assertiveness from the religious right. Uh, uh, we've seen uh, tension uh, uh, arise. Uh, all of that is uh, obviously tied in some ways to the Arab-Israeli conflict, Palestinian-Israeli conflict, although it's not identical to it. Uh, and I think we have to be particularly watchful, those of, who, who are following the internal conflict, we have to be particularly watchful of that environment inside. This is an extremely consequential issue. I think the Arab-Israeli issue is not just about Arabs and Israelis. It's not about Palestinians and Israelis. It is consequential for the rest of the region and beyond. Um, uh, I call it the prism of pain through which Arabs and many Muslims see the world. What happens on that issue is critical for American foreign policy. If you look at uh, the decline of uh, the perception, the image of the U.S. in the past year uh, since the Obama administration has come to office, the primary issue of complaint across the board is this single issue of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Uh, when uh, President Clinton, uh, when, when um, uh, Secretary of State Clinton spoke uh, in Washington a few weeks ago, uh, she was comparing uh, her uh, vision of uh, uh, how the international community saw the Arab-Israeli issue in the 1990s when she was first lady versus now when she's Secretary of State. And she said in the mid-90s when I used to go around with President Clinton um, and meet with world leaders across the board, very few people used to raise the Arab-Israeli issue. Today, almost every leader around the world will raise this issue as the number one, number two, or number three issue in the global priorities. This is a global issue. It is consequential. This has to be, I think, uh, the most urgent issue that we have to pay attention to. Thank you. Very good. We thank our panel. You can see why um, Abby and everybody else chose these people of times across the panel um, that issues that are kind of outside of various state uh, questions came up. Questions of crime, questions of refugees, um, questions of water. Uh, all these things seem to me uh, very much to define uh, the future as we're going forward. Um, when I think about kind of the job that we have in front of us, um, and that is to return, a and I'd like to return a little bit um, to as what might be a more academic um, question, and that is to focus again uh, on the issues of primary prevention and sort of what do we do with the information that we have. And the information that we have has been developed now by institutes like the U.S. Institute for Peace. Um, I was very glad when uh, a number of people early on talked about the Genocide Prevention Task Force, this idea of you know, how do we think in advance uh, about primary prevention. When I think about the academic work that's done here on primary prevention or Michael Lund's bell curve uh, about how conflict um, arises and then, and then falls, so my question really to the panel is, I wonder if you would take each of your regions and the issues that you have raised and also consider the academic work that's been done, the thinking that's been done on questions of primary prevention. And do you see any lessons there? I, mean, I spent my career for 30 years as a Foreign Service officer, almost as, a, as an, operation, an operator. Um, but I see now that there's all this wonderful work done can't, does it apply? And I guess I'd, I'd phrase that question. First, do you see themes that apply across the regions? Um, and secondly, are there themes that, uh, that apply particularly to the region? And I'd be interested um, to sort of connect this to questions of primary prevention. So would you like to go first? Uh, sure. I, I just want to say, you know, we, we have this uh, obviously artificial division of, of conflict prevention, management, and resolution, and we know that that is – not exactly something that is easy to divide. Um, uh, I think at some, at some level, uh, when we think of a conflict prevention, we're thinking of something that might turn into conflict that we're trying to prevent. Uh, in the case that I highlighted most, the Arab-Israeli issue, uh, we have a conflict, uh, and, and what we're trying to prevent is escalation uh, that could, uh, you know, uh, 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 be hugely consequential, both in terms of human terms and in terms of uh, political consequences globally. Uh, I think at some point you can no longer prevent and manage. You can resolve. You have to yeah. resolve. And I think we're at a point in in Arab-Israeli conflict, in particular, where the issue is no longer about conflict prevention. It is really about 
resolution. It's either going to be resolved or we're going to be face another generation of uh, some kind of conflict that is going to have to be managed, uh, maybe in some ways, but, but it's very hard to do. May I ask, um, if I could, if you uh, if, take that, but then take the other, another of the examples that you used in your talk, Yemen. I mean, is there, are there possibilities for this kind of primary prevention to apply in some fashion in Yemen as opposed to the Arab-Israeli conflict or in addition to the Arab-Israeli conflict? No question. I think, uh, first, uh, I, I would start, with, you know, sort of from the outside, not from the inside, because one of, one of the problems in any conflict, but including the one in Yemen, is the expansion. Uh, I mean, there's no question that uh, uh, one of the worries for the international community is not just what happens in Yemen itself and, and the consequences that instability is going to have human costs, but also it's going to be a home for groups like al-Qaeda that thrive in an unstable environment. But the fact that it could draw players like, uh, like Iran and also Saudi Arabia, it already has up to a point, but it could draw them in more. Uh, I think that you need to create a regional uh, uh, regime that deals with it. Uh, you, we cannot, we've learned that about Iraq as well, uh, that it is, you can't just look at it in isolation, because in the end, those conflicts, uh, there are a lot of players outside who have an interest in what happens inside. And unless you figure out a mechanism to bring them on board, to coordinate, uh, to, to work together, uh, where they're an asset to prevent the conflict, not a source of, of, of fueling that conflict down the road, I think you cannot succeed. And I think in Iraq in particular, this is going to become more important as we move ahead. Thank you. Maybe I just then uh, talk John Park. You, one of the things that you raised in the North Korea example was the question of refugees. And refugees, North Korea, China. But is there a primary prevention strategy that you'd be working on today um, to deal with the potential of a refugee crisis in North Korea, both to deal with the North Korean psychology in this, but also the psychology in Beijing? Well, one thing there is uh, the role of China. And, you know, frankly, uh, trying to figure out what China has by way of plans and preparations to deal with potential refugees is a, is a challenge right now. Uh, the U.S., uh, through different groups, have tried to engage the Chinese side, but the Chinese have basically shied away from that because any discussion about the role of refugees is usually tied to contingency planning. Uh, and that has a direct connotation to state collapse, which the Chinese government is adamant about preventing. Uh, but one thing about the refugee issue that can be helpful, and uh, academic research, uh, policy research, is definitely shedding more light, uh, is related to how China treats its borders. While the Chinese are very reticent to talk anything about the Chinese North Korean border. Uh, we do have a precedent. Now there's case study analysis of what the Chinese did with their border with Burma. There was a refugee issue there. Uh, the circumstances were certainly different in terms of what caused it, but how the Chinese addressed it, I think there will be important lessons learned that can inform any type of uh, potential discussion either at track 1.5 or for further research on uh, how the Chinese would deal with refugees in that border area. And if you were giving somebody a sort of policy idea, how would you kind of translate that lesson into something that, you know, an Assistant Secretary for East Asian Affairs or someone at USIP in the .5 part of that track might pursue? One of the things, uh, in a certain extent, there has been a great deal of focus on Chinese strategic prowess, uh, this notion that they've planned everything out, they gamed everything out, and they're ready. Uh, I think that's a dangerous assumption. Uh, and, you know, certainly colleagues in government in Washington are very concerned about how the Chinese would respond in terms of these policies to the rapidly changing situation inside North Korea. Uh, you know, a lesson that I think can be drawn from the Chinese experience in a place like Burma and how that can inform discussions uh, between government officials is that in this area that if North Korea is still contentious for the Chinese government, how can you argue by analogy? Because one thing that we do know is that mm -hmm the types of capabilities the Chinese have arrayed on the border regions are similar. Uh, so people's armed police, they have very specific roles and responsibilities and missions. If there's a way to talk about the Burmese case, uh, I think we would be able to draw out some potential practices that the Chinese may apply in the North Korean case. Interesting. Any other panelists on, on this question of the sort of lessons of primary prevention to to the issues, uh, to, the, to the regional issues that you that you raised, Mark. Well, you know, I, primary prevention is is a sometimes very hard thing to do, um, 
And I'm thinking in an African context, uh, and to take my example of Nigeria, if we were to go to the Nigerians and say, you know, we've given this a lot of thought and we think that in six to 12 months there's an 85 percent chance of you, um, you know, that, the reaction is going to be very swift and indignant and, you know, we're going to be shown the door. Um, I, you know, trying to get these nations to repent, you know, um, is, sometimes, is sometimes a tough thing. On the other hand, um, it's probably worth keeping in mind that many of the preventive prevention problems we face are old conflicts. Uh, the other two I mentioned, Sudan and the Congo, I mean, the reason that prevention is necessary is that the previous attempts to fix these problems have not been fully implemented. Uh, so prevention in those cases, and in many cases, is really a question of, of fixing it the first time around. I'd almost say that an ounce of, uh, of, of cure is worth a pound of, pound of prevention in those cases. So uh, primary prevention, I think, in, in many cases, is a question of getting it, of enforcing the peace agreements and carrying out the undertakings that, uh, that have, 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 have already been arrived at. Good. Thank you. Peter. Just, I'm not sure this responds to your question very well. But there is a, a, a one thing, a real difference between dealing with the kinds of conflicts that most of the other panelists have talked about and the crime, internal violence problem that, that I tended to focus on, in that you can solve conflicts of the more, tr let's call it traditional kind, I don't know how else to, uh, country by country in some ways, in some situations. In other words, I think if you ended the conflict in Colombia, for example, now in Latin America, it would be ended and it would be over and you would have a region then that didn't have conflict. The crime problem you can't resolve in a single country. The crime problem responds to a variety of demands, variety of supply factors, and that eliminating it in one country will just push it to another country, which is very different. In other words, going after it in Colombia, and there apparently has been some reductions in uh, uh, the territory devoted to cocaine, although the amount of uh, – to coca, the amount of production is – may not be that less. But all of a sudden we're now seeing a country like Bolivia, which had almost eliminated coca production, is now coming back stronger. And similarly, Peru. Uh, so the crime issue, and indeed the Mexico crime syndicates emerged – when the very successful effort by George Bush to push the uh, trafficking of, co of cocaine from South America through the Caribbean was stopped there, and then they began to move through Mexico. So it really does. So I, I just say that. And then just one other small – the role of the U.S. in some situations in, is, is very important. I think the U.S. has played a very important role in Colombia. I think that the U.S. assistance program, the Plan Colombia, Mark was involved, has been, you know, really a, I think, an outstanding success, although at a very high cost, both in terms of money, in terms of actual financial costs for the United States, half a billion dollars a year, not many countries that the U.S. can spend anywhere near that amount of money in. And secondly, in terms of, you know, the, the brutality and the uh, nastiness, the scandals that have enveloped the government, a lot of – Colombia has been very successful, but it's been at a high cost. And uh, I just think that it's, ju it's very hard to imagine that the U.S. was ready to invest anywhere near the effort of force in the rest of Latin America. In Mexico, the – Bill, half a billion dollars a year doesn't matter a whole lot, frankly. It sort of shows U.S. support. And what the U.S. might be helpful in in lessening the uh, uh, smuggling of armaments to Mexico or the U.S. in reducing uh, its own drug consumption in the country are both very long-term propositions that are going to be very hard to make any difference in any short-run period. And uh, – uh, and then you begin to go beyond Mexico and you have three or four countries in Central America. You have a half a dozen countries in the Caribbean. 
And it just mounts up, and, and really, the, the only thing, it really is going to depend on those countries to get it right somehow. And they're going to pay the huge part of the cost. We're not going to pay a high cost, frankly. And uh, just don't know what the U.S. role could be. I mean, I really do think that this needs a hell of a lot more uh, more more study than, than, it, than it's gotten so far. I mean... And certainly our uh, overall drug policy needs uh, sort of real attention. I think it's, it's one of those policies that's stuck in time warp and uh, nobody really wants to debate it. It's, Congress is sort of afraid of it and uh, it just sits there. We spend lots of money. We have lots of people in jail and it doesn't accomplish very much. Good. Nick, would you like in on, on this particular just, topic? Just briefly because I think uh, uh, William's comments uh, – on Africa apply to some extent also for the Eurasian space. But in the end, you know, we, we, can, we can have the theories. We know what the literature says. You've got to tie it, as was said this morning, you have to tie it to political will to act. And particularly when you look at the Eurasian space and some of these other areas, uh, it is easy to make arguments why the costs of preventive action are high and risky and that the costs of inaction can be deferred and delayed. And that's usually what happens is that you see these things build up, uh, but you know what the costs of intervening are and you don't want to pay them, and you hope that maybe they can be deferred and maybe you'll dodge the bullet. And that's sort of what we've seen with Kyrgyzstan with the extreme reluctance of anyone to, to really want to get involved in there right now. Good, thank you. The other question I would like to just pose to the panel before we go to audience questions is the other thing that struck me in every single – uh, presentation was the focus on the possibilities of regional um, organizations. And if you think of the African Union, the six-party talks, the Shanghai Cooperation um, Organization, um, in Latin America, the OAS, the Mercosur, it should be a little bit less in, 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 in the Middle East, but perhaps there are lessons from you know, organizations like Helsinki someday to be applied uh, in the Middle East. I don't know, but it, it's an interesting question anyway. And I'd be interested in the panel's views on whether, given this grouping of regional organizations. One, do you see the possibility of, of infusing them as organizations with the desire, the interest, the capacity to do conflict prevention? Uh, just as we were talking earlier about the professional education of foreign service officers, is there a professional education to be done of these regional organizations? And secondly, I was very struck by the number of times people talked about the regional organizations working with one another. So NATO works with the African Union. Um, maybe there's cross-fertilization in, 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 um, in Asia. Uh, um, Nick talked a little bit about the Arctic, where you'd have organizations like the Council of Baltic Sea States working with NATO, working with the United Nations, working with the European Union. So I'd be interested in whether you think that these regional organizations have capacity, whether it's possible for an organization like USIP to infuse them with more capacity, and whether you see, going forward, more work between um, these organizations. I'd be interested in, um, if anybody had a, had a quick view on that, and then we'll go to the audience questions. Please. Well, in, terms of, in terms of the Middle East, I mean, um, first of all, you know, the, the regional organizations do play a role, and in some ways in the, in the Palestinian-Israeli negotiations, uh, because of the internal vulnerability of, of the Palestinian Authority, uh, they have felt that they need an, a, a role from the Arab world Right. directly, right. E even to legitimize the negotiations. And, and President Mahmoud Abbas felt he had to go to the Arab League to get authorization, right. in essence, to go to this proximity talks that we're now engaged in for four months. Uh, a lot of the Israelis think that uh, one of the incentives for them in concluding a final status agreement would be to make peace with the rest of the Arab world. And so there's the Arab Peace Initiative has become part of, you know, it is a regional organizational, uh, uh, you know, position that has that is weighing in. Uh, in, in the negotiations. So we do have, it's not that uh, you say maybe not in the Middle East. Actually, there is right. something like that a in the Middle point. East. I think the problem has been something that goes outside of the, the, the Arab world, that is, that, that involves Israel, involves Iran, involves Turkey. Uh, and that has been complicated by the Arab-Israeli conflict itself. And recently, by the problem that I laid out up front, which is that after the Iraq war, there is a sense of weakness in the Arab world, and Arabs are somewhat concerned about bringing 
Turkey in or bringing Iran in or bringing Israel in because they feel they're marginalized and they're, these powers are weighing in on their issues, what they believe their issues, including, including Iraq. So there's a little bit of discomfort with that. There's also discomfort uh, on the Israel issue, in part because uh, take the nuclear proliferation issue, which the administration wants to pursue on a rule-based kind of foreign policy, which is uh, we're not only telling Iran that they shouldn't develop nuclear weapons, but we also want the Israelis to be a little more open about the nuclear issue and have a conversation about what they're doing, uh, propose some kind of a regional uh, dialogue about proliferation to prevent also Arab states from ultimately developing it. Well, you know, how could you do it when you have the environment with the Israelis obviously are reluctant for their own, because of the conflict itself, the relationship with Iran. So I think it's a bit difficult, but it is the way to go. Mm-hmm. And, and it is the way to go in the context of the conflict resolution that is inevitable. I don't think it's going to happen. I mean, part of it is it has to be simultaneous. Uh, In in some ways, you have to put these ideas on the table. Uh, You have to make them catch as ideas. I think the administration is actually doing the right thing while while we don't have a mechanism yet or we don't have an organization yet. Raising the issues matters. And I think when you have an opportunity to clinch it, uh, what people have adjusted to the ideas, it could happen. And in the in the 1990s, when the Oslo process was in place, uh, there were these multilateral uh, talks about issues that are relevant regionally. Uh, they were promising. If the political process had moved forward, I think they would have paid off. Yes, yeah, they're and, not on their own. And Madrid might have also become uh, turned itself into an organization itself. Absolutely, yeah, a very fair point. Nick, please. Yeah. Having raised the the question of NATO and the SCO in the talk now. in in the question point to to look at some of the the problems that that would raise. I mean, one of the question, one of the issues that would prevent closer working relations is, of course, differing organizations having much different views about what security is, so that the SCO defines security not only as preservation of kind of peace and making sure you don't have... uh, terrorism and the like, but really the preservation of the existing political status quo in each of the countries. And certainly the European Union and the United States want to encourage reform and change. And so that if you have a situation where uh, we are uh, all talking about, well, we want to preserve security and prevent conflicts from breaking out, and uh, uh, an SEO perspective is fine, let's just support an existing government to the hilt in a particular country. Uh, and enable it to, to fend off challenges, and, and, and uh, NATO and the United States are saying, and the European Union are saying, no, we want to encourage political change, political movement uh, that, that might preclude that kind of cooperation uh, from happening. And then, of course, uh, the other reality, too, being that, uh, you, again, in the Eurasian space, certainly conflict uh, prevention, resolution management is linked to, to geopolitical issues, and uh, it, it may be difficult to, uh, to sort of put all of that on hold and say, well, NATO and SCO peacekeepers will just work in the short term to ensure peace and stability and somehow will avoid right. these larger questions down yeah. the road. So you know, that, that raises its head that some of these conflicts, uh, if left by themselves, might be <laughs> solvable, but they're not left to themselves, right. and, and that has to be faced as an right. issue. Thank you so much. Dr. Park. As I mentioned earlier, for Northeast Asia, the challenge is there are no uh, institutions on a regional or international basis that function there. Uh, A lot of people point to the six-party talks, but uh, you really have to look at the six-party talks as a very nascent mechanism. And there, uh, there's an ongoing debate of whether it's effective or a failure. And for many, it depends on how you define it. Uh, If you define it as a denuclearization forum, people give it a failing mark. If you define it as a nascent crisis management mechanism, people give it at least a fighting chance. Uh, the, the notion there is it's too early to tell. Uh, with uh, Ambassador Grossman, what you mentioned about uh, the Helsinki process, it's interesting because when the six-party talks were going well, the whole question of what comes next, and it, it seems like a distant past, but uh, literally uh, about two and a half years ago, there was a conference in Seoul in Jeju Island, which is on the southern tip of South Korea, they gathered all of the architects of the Helsinki uh, Accords mm. uh, and all of the former German officials who dealt with German reunification. And the question was, how can we brand uh, and apply the lessons learned from Helsinki to Northeast Asia? 
they uh, came up with what's, what's called the Jeju process. And again, uh, I would you know, draw people's memory back to that period. Uh, the United States had entered into negotiations with North Korea in the context of the six party talks, uh, had come very close to the end of phase two, which is nuclear disablement of the Yongbyon nuclear facilities. Phase three would have been about verification inspections, and then this notion of U.S. Uh, North Korea diplomatic uh, normalization, this idea of implementing things like peace and stability in Northeast Asia, and then this notion of a Jeju peace process. Uh, that being then and now being now, if we look at uh, what the capacity uh, of the various parties can be, uh, I think it's in the notion of these track 1.5 gatherings. They are not uh, the complete proxy for what could have been, but certainly play an important role in terms of moving forward in getting the different parties to talk about these differing perspectives and where they are with their mapping exercises because you see a very different future. And in these dif different futures, they also feed into policies of how they will deal with North Korea. So priority right now is something called deconflicting plans. Each country has a different plan in, in terms of how they would deal with instability in North Korea. And deconflicting them uh, has to occur, but the question is where. And the track one, it's too sensitive. And the track two, the academics and other uh, colleagues don't necessarily have, uh, they have not necessarily been following these type of issues. And that puts us in the track 1.5 space, where institutes like USIP and Asian government uh, counterparts can form these recurring channels of communication and achieve these uh, very important tasks of closing gaps. So let me conclude with uh, what the Institute has been doing. By convening meetings in this area uh, during the process of uh, the six party talks moving forward, uh, we were able to convene these uh, gatherings and commission papers on what nuclear disablement would look like. Before phase two of the six party talks began, uh, we commissioned David Albright to actually lay down 13 steps of nuclear disablement. And that was a report that was circulated among the six-party talks. We also did uh, a piece on what a peace and security mechanism agreement would look like, something that would be a nascent charter for the region. And some were hoping that the peace and security mechanism within the six-party talks would be the beginnings of perhaps the first regional uh, organization in Northeast Asia. The final point uh, was related to uh, the whole notion of deconflicting again. Uh, it's one thing to identify it, but how do you actually get the government officials from the various countries to talk very frankly about that? I think that right now is a perennial challenge. Good. Very good. Thank you very much. Mark, would you like to have a uh, comment on this? I, we'll I think there's, the a lot, there's a lot that can be said about regional organizations. Um, I, I would just make one, maybe one, one point here. You talked about, Mark, about the, the links between different regional organizations. One of the most important links that occurs to me, at least in an African context, is the link between the regional organizations, AU, and the UN. Mm -hmm. Because what, our ability to use the UN Security Council in whatever way we, we think is necessary to prevent conflict, try to mobilize the Security Council on whether it's on Sudan or Darfur or Zimbabwe, they're going to depend a lot on what the AU's view is. Right. And we've often complained that, well, we can't get in traction on Darfur because of a Chinese veto in the UN. But the fact is that the AU had decided that there needed to be traction on Darfur, the Chinese veto falls away. Mm -hmm. So there's... there's um, the ability of regional organizations, the extent that they are, as you say, infused with this desire to, 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 to take seriously conflict prevention, uh, their ability to sort of set the parameters of what we can do in the UN is something we shouldn't, shouldn't underestimate. Excellent. Thank you. Peter, would you like one minute on this, or should we go to well, before we go to questions? Let me just say that uh, <laughs> there's just a lot of uh, restrictions on the organization of American states and what it can respond to, what it can't respond to. On the whole, its best role is when it's involved early on in a conflict that it sort of senses that it begins to talk to the various parties before it really emerges. Once it emerges, it really has a very mm -hmm. difficult time in playing a, a role in tamping it down. Mm -hmm. But it does have a lot of smart people who are in touch with the re – and, you know, they sometimes miss things. They miss the Honduran, uh, uh, which could have – avoided a lot of difficulty. One other thing is the various meetings that the Latin American leaders are now meeting uh, more than probably any other group of leaders have ever met. And frankly, this has had some uh, positive results. Uh, if you take just the Colombian-Venezuela difference, right. it's not that the Colombians talk to the Venezuelans. It's that the Colombians talk to the Brazilians and the Venezuelans talk to the Brazilians and the Argentines. And there's just efforts by, you know, presidents talking to presidents to say, hey, what, shouldn't you do this or shouldn't you apologize for this or shouldn't you sort of 
keep down the rhetoric on that issue. And that can be helpful if they're meeting, uh, as they often do, let's say, uh, often as uh, every couple of months or so. Good. Thank you very much. Well, we'd like to now invite questions to the panels. I know there are two microphones here, so maybe the best thing to do is people would like to line up. Um, and we ask simply that you keep your questions short, if you could. Uh, identify yourself and if you wish your organization. And we'll start right here. Ambassador Bellamy, I'm Monique Beadle with Falling Whistles. We're a grassroots campaign for peace in Congo. What's your analysis of the impact of the Monuc Monusco drawdown on the legitimacy of and the outcome of the upcoming presidential election? The 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 request you mean by the government of uh, the Kabila government to for the you know UN peacekeeping operation to wind up by uh, next summer? Uh, well, you know I think that um, should I we, we don't do this one at a time like this? Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Um, you know I'm not I'm not sure what the exact you know impact of that. You know I think obviously this is a manifestation part of the manifestation of what I mentioned earlier about this newly resurgent sense of of Congolese nationalism and this restlessness with the international tutelage that they've lived under for a, for a certain period of time and this new assertiveness on the part of the Kabila government. I don't think anybody believes that the, you know, throwing out the UN peacekeeping operation next summer is a good idea, you know, or is, is going to augur as well for the, for the Congo. Um, you know, I think a bigger problem uh, in, the, in the short term is, is what I alluded to in my remarks, the, the fact that the international community is continuing to um, is continuing to engage with the, with the with the Congolese government with this air of normalcy, uh, and without this sense of without the sense of urgency or concern, and that is that the the assistance is continuing to flow, um, the you know debt relief uh, debt relief continues to be you know a very um, uh, important thing for the government and and is likely to come through in ways that in fact reinforce Kabila's. Um, chances for re-election. I think the Kabila strategy, the government strategy, is to make sure they have no competition. I mean, that's that's how he plans to win the election. Not not that he's going to go out and you know, you know, win over win over hearts and minds. He's going to make sure that there's not any serious serious competition out there. So, um, I you know, I think it's a it's another very worrisome very worrisome situation. We've had, uh, we've had a couple of questions from the breakout room, both of which Mark focused on in the Congo. So if we come back to that, at some okay, point, sure. We will. Yes, sir. Uh, this is a question for the broader panel. I'm Mark Buell. I'm on a writing sabbatical uh, currently. If um, this is from this side of optimism, if uh, preventing violent conflict actually works, if you come up with a mechanism to actually do it, uh, and it works very well, uh, how can we uh, guard against people, policymakers, actually taking it for granted? And the reason why I bring this up is because everyone knows what an intelligence failure is, but what is an intelligence success? And so it goes to, to your question. The reason I bring it up, by the way, is because of uh, what Mr. Park, uh, Dr. Park brought up about the South Korean uh, sh ship sinking. And will uh, organizations, entities, North Korea, seek out uh, non-attributable means of engaging that forego that process. It's a great job description of writing sabbatical. I think that's very <laughs> yeah, good. Yeah, that's terrific. I don't, I don't want to give away who I work ah, for. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Well, Dr. Park, why don't you start, and then I'd all be, also be interested in Nick's answer to that question. Sure. Uh, that's a very interesting uh, uh, question in the way it's phrased, and, and I, I go back to uh, what Ambassador Solomon said in his opening remarks about uh, mm -hmm. prevention uh, being the best way to deal with something, the alternative being picking up the piece of something that's very costly in lives and treasure. Uh, with respect to uh, the, the whole notion of conflict prevention working or not, uh, you know, it goes back in, in Northeast Asia, go back, it goes back to the role of, of uh, China and what China is doing by way of its prevention. They don't call it conflict prevention, but uh, certainly their behavior and how they're dealing with North Korea is one where they don't want to pick up the pieces, and that, that is something that they have reaffirmed over and over again. Uh, a slightly different direction to ask, answering your question. I think signposts are very important in terms of gauging where we're at. But unfortunately, with Northeast Asia and North Korea, everyone has a different set of signposts, even within countries. But one thing that's unique about uh, China is uh, their statements really matter. And uh, their long-held view of conflict prevention with North Korea has been maintaining peace and stability. So you hear that phrase over and over again. I think the canary in the mine shaft and something you have to be very mindful of is when the Chinese statements change. If it changes from, and it's already changed, right now they're asking the parties to exercise common restraint. So now it's common restraint. 
the big canary in the mine shaft will be when the Chinese are concerned about law and order in the border area. So we already see a gradation of the signposts. And how you read the tea leaves, if it's your understanding that's important, but the critical function here and a key part of why their conflict prevention really works or not is how you communicate that understanding among the different groups. Nick? I think a key part of this is to continue to encourage a high degree of, in all of these areas, these potential conflicts, high degree of transparency, direct speaking, frank speaking, and for people to know exactly what capabilities are on the table. You know, when you look at the run-up to the Russo-Georgian War of 2008, you could look back and you could see the signs were there, but you also had a lot of subterfuge and you had a lot of sort of just ignoring or pretending that the problem couldn't happen, that it was inconceivable that you could have a direct armed conflict. And therefore, because you started from that premise that there could be no armed conflict, then you wished it away, that it wasn't going to happen because, you know, countries don't do this anymore. They don't do this in Europe anymore, the greater European neighborhood. And so that I think that in part being aware of that this can happen and therefore having sides in a conflict or national actors, subnational actors be very clear about what their intentions are, what their capabilities are, what they're prepared to do, and not wishing it away is an important step. The other thing there, too, may be to, in some cases, when do you walk away from a peace process? When do you say that a peace process has failed or that it's not producing results? I mean, this is one of the questions of the frozen conflicts of the Caucasus as well, which is at what point do you say the Nagorno-Karabakh peace process, it's meaningless? I'm not saying that it is. I'm just saying at what point do you start to begin to conceive and say it's not worth it to continue to have a process and to have meetings and to give people the illusion that progress is being made when no progress is being made? Because that may then force stakeholders to then stare into the abyss. Because if they then stare into the abyss and then you hope that they're rational decision makers or policy makers, but that, you know, also sometimes made that could be a way to move forward on some of these things. But where you just sort of say, well, we're going to have another set of talks and, you know, maybe 30 or 40 years from now we'll move forward. That may, may not, it may cloak the fact that underneath that ice of a process, frozen process, uh, you have something happening under the surface that then catches you by surprise. May, may I just make one comment to you before, and take the advantage of the chair before I come to your question? And that is the other thing about complacency, which I think is very important and relevant to USIP, is that the actors who might have been involved in something successful, Ambassador Blaney, for example, Liberia, people who worked on Macedonia, um, yeah. uh, Lord Robertson, uh, Javier Solana, people move on. And the lessons that are drawn from how did we do this and what was successful, what worked, what didn't work, are gone. And so some systematic way to, to get people's history and to get people's lessons is also a way to, uh, to, to avoid complacency because you then build in the learning inside of the institutions. And that's something that the government certainly should be doing, but it seems to me uh, an important role for an organization like USIP. Yes, please. Thanks very much. I'm Bridget Moix with the Friends Committee on National Legislation. Uh, thank you so much for the panel. It's been very informative uh, for a generalist like me to hear the different regional expertise. Um, I wanted to ask um, and also to appreciate the, that each of you addressed in some way the role of the U.S. in helping prevent m and mitigate conflict and trying not to fuel it as well. I think that's part of probably one of the most important parts of our discussion um, today and in Washington. Uh, so I wanted to ask about two specific uh, situations and the role of the U.S. in them. One that was not mentioned on this panel, but that Ambassador Yates mentioned, which is Kenya, which I thought might have been in your list of top three and that we're very concerned about and watching closely, both in terms of the constitutional referendum, but longer term leading up to 2012 and what can the U.S. be doing to help prevent violent conflict there. And also uh, Iran. And I very much appreciated um, you noting that the sanctions could increase pressure for a war against Iran um, and that we need to mitigate against that. So what can the U.S. Be doing in that case as well. Good. Both good questions. Mark first, and then uh, Chibli, yeah. please. Well, Kenya, I guess I, I could have listed as three or four or five. It's certainly, it's certainly a major, major concern. 
Um, you know, Kenya is one of those cases where the United States does have special, for a lot of reasons, does have does have sort of special entree and special influence, um, and where where the views of the United States are taken seriously by by all sides. Uh, and I don't I don't think the problems in Kenya are that complex in terms of what needs to be done to try to, to try to insulate that society against a recurrence of the kind of violence we saw in 2007 2008. Uh, there has to be, and, and I, I think it's achievable, uh, but I, I do think it'll take a, a, a bit of an international <coughs> effort to ensure that the two sides, and there are two main protagonists here, there are two main two main parties to this conflict, you know, uh, are, are, are have rules of the road that they have agreed in advance, and those rules are transparent, and there's a sense on the part of the Kenyan public that when this referendum vote comes down, uh, it's not going to be a question of the lights are going to be turned off, the votes are going to be accounted, accounted, and the results are going to be announced the following morning. It has to be done completely transparently, Completely openly, the two sides have to commit to the process, have to commit to the to the outcome, and I think that will go a long way toward preventing what happened before. The other thing that needs to happen longer term, and this is true not just with Kenya but for most of the countries that that, that, that we deal with, is that the security sector reform and particularly reform of the police has to be pursued much more vigorously. And one reason that these these communities end up at a war with each other is that they don't have any protection from the state. And when there's no state protection, when there's no police, when there's no one you can turn to, you fall back on your own resources, and, and, the, and that's when you begin to get the intercommunal and the, and the ethnic violence, and that certainly was the case in Kenya. This is a long-term project, though, and even in those states where we get some sign of political will and political commitment on the part of governments, whether we're willing to come up with the resources is a really big question, and too often we're not. You know, we're much better at telling them what they need to do in order to fix the problem they don't have the resources, and we often come up short, unfortunately. Sir, yeah, Iran. Uh, you know, on, on the Iran issue, there, there, there are a couple of things that have to be noted. One is that the best service we do is really addressing the Arab-Israel issue. Let me tell you why I, I think that. Because I think even the Israeli concern, if you look at uh, what are the Israelis worried about with Iran's nuclear power, it is less the – fact that Iran might use them against Israel. Israel has a second strike capability. I think most uh, experts in Israel don't think that Iran would use nuclear weapon against them. They worry that Iran is going to be so empowered uh, that they're going to be bolder in supporting groups, particularly groups like Hezbollah and Hamas, to undermine Israel, uh, groups that would not be particularly relevant if, in fact, you have a, a resolution of the, the Arab-Israeli conflict. Most Arabs, by the way, outside of, you know, the Arab states and uh, neighboring Iran, like uh, the United Arab Emirates, certainly worry about Iran, direct Iranian threat. Um, but most other Arabs, uh, like Egypt or Jordan or Morocco, who are also fearful of an empowered Iran, are not really worried about Iran in the sense that they, Iran is going to attack them. Uh, or they're going to go to war with Iran. They're, they're more concerned about an Iranian empowerment that would meddle in their domestic uh, politics and would exploit an Arab-Israeli conflict that is undermining uh, their own legitimacy in their own countries. So uh, the Arab-Israeli conflict is actually the source of the worry about Iran in some ways. So the, the biggest service the U.S. can do is, is actually to deliver uh, some kind of mediated settlement that would reduce the, 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 the chance that Iran would be influential. Having said that, obviously, you know, that, that, you know, the timing may, 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 may not work out that way. So the Israelis are still thinking about whether they want to carry out an attack or not. Now, in my own judgment, the Israelis cannot do it without U.S. support. What do I mean by that? They certainly can attack Iran uh, relatively effectively uh, and, and, and undermine facilities in Iran without American support, uh, and even that is a, you know, uh, they can't do it in a sustained fashion, and certainly not in a manner that would assure that Iran is not going to be able to have, uh, you know, uh, to rebuild its, its capabilities within a relatively short order. Uh, the main thing is what happens the morning after, because Iran is not going to sit still, and there will be consequences, uh, and, the, and the Israelis will need sustained American support the morning after to be able to uh, to deal with the crisis that is likely to emerge. Now, uh, the, the issue is whether the Israelis think that they need an American green light or whether they think like Egypt did with the Soviet Union in 1973. The Egyptians even went to the extent of expelling Soviet uh, f uh, advisors from Egypt just a few months before they waged the war, uh, being certain that once they start the war, their ally is going to support them no matter what, because you, 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 you create a 
a different environment, then they can guarantee American, uh, the Israelis could guarantee American support. If Israel is at war with Iran the morning after, no matter how it started, it's inevitable or the Israelis would have to think that American support would be forthcoming. That means that the U.S. has to be very co coordinating very closely day in and day out uh, and sending the right messages because uh, these kind of calculations are inevitable, I think. Uh, uh, I think for now, you know, uh, Israelis appear to be divided among themselves on whether it's wise or not. Uh, but if there is a decision on their side that it's wise, I am not sure that there is all that much that the United States can do, frankly, because I think the Israelis will inevitably calculate that uh, whatever we say or tell them or uh, beforehand, uh, they will assess that the morning after in, uh, the United States will be supporting them because it'll be, Israel, an ally, will be against a, a country the U.S. is opposing uh, and and uh, it'll have to, to, to be forced to take sides. John, thank you. Yes, please. Thank you. Andy Loomis in the Conflict Prevention Office of the State Department's SCRS, Office of Coordinator, Coordinator for Reconstruction and Stabilization. Uh, I have a question. I wanted to take this opportunity to turn the spotlight back on you, Mark, if I could, and that is um, too often, as you know, the uh, long-term prevention planning gets displaced by urgent crises. And I'm curious of your, given your former high perch in the department, what you would recommend, what adjust, adjustments to the bureaucratic structures or incentives to ensure that long-term prevention gets uh, sufficiently uh, focused on and prioritized uh, inside the U.S. government. Thank you. Um, well, I'll be short since I'm not a panel member. Um, <laughs> first, I think it goes back to the point that uh, Dick Solomon and others have made. It goes to the professional education of people in the Foreign Service and in the Civil Service, people who serve our country in the State Department. Uh, and that is from the very beginning, questions of confl conflict prevention, diplomacy before and after conflict have to be part of the ethos of people who join the State Department, be that either Foreign Service or Civil Service people. Second thing I would say is you put your finger on part of it, which is how do you then structure the incentives to make that true? And one of the ways is through SCRS through service in SCRS, through service in whole of government, through service in other places perhaps in the government that are working on diplomacy before conflict, uh, perhaps after conflict, so that, those, uh, that, so that those jobs are promotable and those jobs are honored and those jobs uh, bring people uh, the kind of respect and promotion that they desire. I think the way that SCRS has stated, has put out kind of the three levels is a really good way to think about this, that you have people ready to deploy in a number of 200, people ready to deploy in a, in a number of 2,000, and then calling on the larger society. I think that makes it a very important part of the normal day-to-day -day life of Foreign Service. And, and finally, I would, um, I, would, I would turn to Colombia, um, where I think uh, starting with uh, Ambassador Pickering and uh, President Clinton uh, and then moving through uh, the next administration, I believe now as well, People have figured out a way, by and large, to make sure that in Colombia people are doing the strategic thinking and the operational thinking simultaneously. And so to go back to your question, you know, one thing you might consider um, would be uh, learning some lessons from how this was done in Colombia, where I would submit to you, again, like Peter said, lots of problems in Colombia, not perfect in Colombia, but on the issue you raise of how to do the strategic and the tactical and the operational simultaneously, I think there are some useful lessons to be learned there. Yes, Mark, please. Can I just follow up that question? Can we just, come back? Let's, okay, but I'll, I'll just, come back to you at the end. Okay. Yeah. I'll bring Columbia up again. Oh, good. Okay, good. Um, thanks so much for your comments. I'm Ginny Bouvier. I'm here at the Inst U.S. Institute of Peace, and I head up our, our Latin America work, which focuses uh, very much on Colombia. I have a couple of comments. I want to thank you for your presentations, and nice to see an old friend, Peter Hakem, but I'm going to um, kind of bring you to task on a couple of things. I think, you know, I would agree with you that um, overall Latin America has had some major improvements in the picture in terms of democratic governance. But I don't think that we can rest on our laurels just yet in terms of conflict and conflict prevention, Colombia being a case in point. Colombia is often pointed to as the success story, but before we congratulate ourselves that the government of Colombia has won the war, I think we should remind ourselves that Colombia is the place that has the oldest guerrilla force in the world. Um, that the war does continue, that the guerrillas have shown themselves incredibly adept at stepping back and waiting and then reemerging again as a threat. Uh, the paramilitary has been a tremendous threat, and they have infiltrated 
the government structures um, such that the Congress is now one-third controlled by paramilitary linked with drug traffickers. So I think that's, even if the conflict in Colombia were to end tomorrow, I disagree with Peter in the sense that the conflict would then be over. I think there are a lot of changes that have happened in the Colombian governance structure that would make it very difficult to say that there's an end. I would just, I know we're, we're short on time, but All I just right. wanted to mention also, at the local level, I think we're seeing things like violence emerging in Bagua over indigenous conflicts over natural resources, and we're seeing more and more of these throughout Latin America that I think are ripe opportunities for prevention to take place. And USIP is, in, is engaging in a study um, of successful case stories looking at stakeholder interventions in five of the Andean countries that will contribute to that kind of thinking about prevention. Excellent. Thanks. Thank you. Peter, there's your chance well, to talk I, about Colombia. I, I just, you know, I, I, I think it's a matter of uh, sort of balancing, uh, what, you know, it's where you sort of end up on the success or failure. It's not a question. I don't think we're very far apart, frankly. Uh, but, you know, I'm sitting on a panel where we're talking about Iran and we're talking about the Israeli-Palestinian in Gaza and we're talking about North Korea uh, and we're talking about the uh, sort of uh, other parts of the, of the world. Uh, and Latin America looks very, very good compared to that. And I just can't help but sort of in relative terms, uh, I certainly, if... Uh, Someone said to me, where would you put if you had uh, 10 experts on conflict resolution in the State Department, I would certainly not sort of assign them or very many of them to Latin America at this stage. That's, that's the point. Not saying that there aren't indigenous conflicts. There's not conflicts over lots of issues. But the, 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 the relative importance and the relative urgency and the relative destructiveness of these conflicts and their reach across the the, hemis the, the world are, are just very, very, very different, I think. Good. Thank you. Why don't we take two questions together, okay? Please. Okay. Um, I'm Jessica Sauer. I'm from Independent Diplomat. And I really identified with what you guys were saying about the importance of regional organizations and the political will to prevent conflict. And looking at those two points, um, I have a question for you about the recent Supreme Court ruling on Holter versus Humanitarian Law Project, where basically held that Americans and American organizations can't work to train or provide material support to groups listed as terrorists. However, this has major ramifications for a lot of different NGOs that are in the field doing work on things such as conflict prevention. And so my question for you today is, um, what's your view on this ruling, and do you think it will impact uh, conflict prevention and uh, conflict mitigation in your area of the field? Good question. I hope there's a lawyer on the panel. Yes, sir. Go ahead. My name is Mangistu, I'm Mangistu Ayala, I'm um, an Ethiopian. Um, I'm studying conflict resolution in Nova Southeastern University. My question is to Ambassador Melai. Um, I agree with you in identifying three countries like Nigeria, Sudan, and Congo, uh, an issue of concern and crisis. But I feel Ethiopia is worse than Nigeria in so many <laughs> indicators. Okay. And I don't know why. It, you just mentioned Ethiopia because it's very important for America in the region. It's, it, it is situated in a volatile region in the Horn of Africa. There is a conflict in, the, in the Somalia which is related also with international terrorism. And all indicators in Ethiopia are showing that it's going in the wrong direction, in very mm -hmm. dangerous direction. You can Thank see you. through the report of the International Crisis Group pre pre predicting that Ethiopia will have a skeletal level of a common ethnic conflict. You can see the human rights reports of the Human Rights Watch and others, and they failed the state index. Good. Ethiopia is in a very bad situation, and I think um, the way America is managing that situation is governed by the policy of fighting against terrorism, and it's kind of condoning tyranny and dictatorship for the myopic interest of fighting uh, terrorism in that area. And I think in the long run that will be uh, a cost to America too. I hope you'll say something about that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We'll come back to that. First, I open the panel on the first question, whether anybody's got a view. You, you, may, have stumped, you may have stumped the band here. You're, you're too young to know what I mean, but John, there was Johnny Carson used to stump the band. You may have stumped the band. Well, you uh, know, on, on, on regional uh, organizations, it's kind of interesting because David Hamburg is here, and, and David uh, supported the – the first time I met him was in, in, when, when the Carnegie Corporation of New York supported a project that I was conducting at uh, 
uh, Cornell uh, on the role of international organizations in uh, in, in ethnic conflict, and um, and this was of course coming out. It was the early 90s, right after the Iraq War, the end of the Cold War. So people were thinking about how are, how is the role of regional organization going to evolve. And it was interesting, the prediction in that book, it was a volume that we put together. We brought in a lot of scholars. I edited it with uh, uh, Milton Esman at Cornell University. And we called it actually International Organization of Ethnic Conflict, a book that, uh, that was published by uh, Cornell University Press. And um, uh, the, the prediction was actually that regional organizations are going to acquire more importance uh, in the post-Cold War era. That was kind of the prediction. Mm-hmm. Uh, in large part because uh, people thought that, uh, you know, with the end of the Cold War, uh, the superpowers will be less interested in, 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 in local conflicts, and, and that's, you know, people are going to be interested in what's in the backyard, and, and then that's going to result in an enhancement of regional organizations. And I think when you look at it, um, it, it hasn't been exactly an accurate prediction. I mean, it's, it's been in, in part accurate in the sense that <coughs> some regional organizations have, have been more, more influential. But I, I think for a variety of reasons, um, in part because of, I would argue, because of the, the America's unexpected America's reengagement in the world. Uh, and, and because I, I think, you know, uh, uh, even before 9/11, it was the globalization issue and, and the empowerment of America, and 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 what that led to, uh, sort of America's leadership in mobilizing uh, things that are, you know, international community beyond regional organizations, and not 9/11. Uh, that it has not worked out the way, uh, you know, it could have been expected. And if I were to look at the region that I follow very closely, the Middle East, and and looking at um, the Arab League, particularly as a regional organization that, you know, has, has a long history, I would not argue that mm-hmm. it is stronger today than it was mm-hmm. uh, in 1990. And, uh, and the same could be said about the, the, the Gulf Cooperation Council, which may be, you know, uh, <coughs> among the members still more. I, I, I think that the U.S. probably has more influence than some of the Gulf Cooperation Council uh, members than the Gulf Cooperation Council itself. Good. Thank you very much. I, I just want to say that although I don't think we're perhaps competent to talk about the ruling, you, you put your finger on a very important question, especially for an organization like Independent Diplomat or others who are kind of in conflict prevention. So just because we can't answer the question doesn't mean it's not an excellent question. I think it is. Mark, on Ethiopia, we've got about five minutes left and three questions. As I said, a number of countries could have qualified for the, for the list, and Ethiopia certainly is a, is a, is a country with, a, with, with, with many problems and a lot of reasons to be worried about it. I suppose I, it, it, it highlights one of the, the, the points that I try to make in my presentation, which is that uh, if, you, if we do identify countries that are at risk, are we willing to confront them? You know, are we willing, you know, are we willing individually or together collectively to, to engage with these governments? Um, and, um, I, you know, that, that's a question that's often posed in the specific case of Ethiopia. I, I suppose I didn't put Ethiopia in the same level as Sudan, um, uh, DRC, or Nigeria, because though there are many problems, there are many worrisome signs out of Ethiopia. The fact is that the Melish government, the regime there, has, you know, for better or worse, been able to, to clamp down on the opposition, to button things down when they felt that they needed to button things down. Uh, it's it's not pretty, um, and uh, it's uh, um, it's not always reassuring. But the risk in Ethiopia of, of, of the country cartwheeling off into large-scale violence of the kind that you might see in Sudan uh, or you might see in Nigeria, the DRC, I don't think is, is quite the same. I don't think that level of, of, of risk of violence confrontation is quite the same. Good. Thank you. Got four minutes, three questions. Uh, I'm Mindy Reiser, Global Peace Services USA. In terms of Latin America, while you didn't use the word failing states or certainly failed states, there certainly are trouble signs from a country like Jamaica. And I'm just wondering, in terms of those who would do ill, whether the disaffection economically in some of these countries could be a bit of a beachhead for those who would do ill. And associated with that, of course, is Hugo Chavez. But what's interesting is not a word was said about Cuba, and that's kind of amazing in itself. And I'm wondering if you have any predictions how that will be going, certainly right. after the death of Fidel, but Raul looks like he's entrenched for a while. Thank you. Sir? I'm Rob Dubois. Uh, like my uh, sabbatical friend there, I'm a generic security advisor. 
And uh, I have 12 questions per panelist. No, no, you have one question in 30 seconds. <laughs> Combined into one question. Yeah, I was actually a short inspired, question at that. Uh, Professor Gvozdiev uh, and uh, uh, Professor, uh, sorry, uh, Talami, Sayyid Talami. We have... Uh, Communication is the one word that really, I think, ties all of this conflict prevention, conflict resolution together. And, and on the idea of, um, specifically, on, I'm thinking about the, the uh, awakening councils, for example, up in the northern part of Iraq. Uh, they're being marginalized. There's hundreds of, well, 100,000 men who are armed and well-trained now and probably not being well-paid or addressed by uh, Maliki. I think we could message Maliki, communication is issue there, and tell him, look at the long-term benefit of taking care of those guys, because right now, Al-Qaeda would love to co-opt them. And as far as the uh, zero-sum uh, uh, transition planning, uh, we need to message to the, uh, the leaders who have that perspective. So I think the question okay. here is that we have a global change. Every generation, barring an apocalyptic change of our technologies, every generation is getting more and more cohesive in communication. Uh, President Obama doesn't want to put his BlackBerry away. Doesn't that lead in the long term, in the big picture, to, uh, uh, I guess, uh, facilitating improved uh, conflict resolution? Good. Thank you. Well, my BlackBerry says we got a couple more minutes. Yes, please. My name is Agri. I'm working for Catholic Charities Migration and Refugee Services. I would like to thank you for the wonderful presentations that you did today. And uh, it is already stated that uh, the three African countries, Sudan, Democratic Republic of Congo, and Nigeria, have a potential violent conflict, which will spill over to the neighboring countries and uh, probably have an effect on the region. I just want to hear more about the interventions that was made so far by the United States international community, as well as the African Union, and then how it was effective. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, come on. My name is Melanie Kawano, and I work at the Before Project. Um, we've been active for some time now in Guinea, and this question is for Ambassador Bellamy. There seemed to have been a shift in U.S. foreign policy with Guinea, especially in the last year, with more resources, um, both economic and staffing. And I am curious if you have any insights into that shift and if that can be replicated elsewhere. Very good. Very good question. Very good questions all, actually. Thank you very much. Why don't we just go down this way and take whatever one you want. Mark, I think a number of them were the shift in resources, to you. I, I didn't quite understand the question. Was the shift in resources made available for Africa? Uh, yeah. uh, for Guinea in particular. Oh, for Guinea. 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 Yeah, well, I, I think that this administration regard, rightly regards Guinea as one of its successful prevention stories. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe not prevention. It's a little hard to, to know, but, but, but I, I, think, I think there's no doubt that this is, this is a good case study of the U.S. working with allies and working with the African Union and working with, the West, you know, with ECOWAS to, um, to take a bad situation uh, and to basically to arrest this, this, uh, this, 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 this downward spiral. Uh, and this is probably a good case of, of what I mentioned before, of actually mm. coming forward with the resources to back up the diplomacy. So, yes, I think that's, that's probably a, uh, a useful, small but useful case study. Peter, would you like to uh, make a prediction on Cuba? Take well, the question, I Jamaica? think uh, <laughs> Sure. I mean, Jamaica, let's just start with the first part. Yeah, there's uh, a dozen other countries in Latin America to, and the Caribbean that are facing similar kinds of problems. Jamaica isn't the only one, and this is what I was talking about with the crime and violence problem. On Cuba, most people see it frozen, that it's not making much movement. Others, a few analysts uh, who have been to Cuba recently, think that the uh, negotiations between the Catholic Church and the government over the uh, political prisoners, uh, that there is some opening beginning to occur. One question that we didn't talk about at all, and I find it interesting in the panel, I just throw it out at least, the problems that uh, U.S. aid has generally in the management and long-term perspective and how it operates and the money it goes and where it goes didn't come in at all in our discussion of conflict resolution. or, And it seems to me that that's part of any kind of long-term strategy it has to be our development aid programs overseas. That's and exactly that, right. Uh, Perhaps okay. there can be a USAID working group over in this corner during lunch. <laughs> no, it, that's a really important question. Nick, I'd give you the last word on the communication question, if you had one. Just briefly, I think that based on what Peter said about Latin America, you need more of that where presidents are talking, uh, not just bilaterally, but multilaterally. Uh, the more communication helps, but again, 
uh, it's not the panacea. The fact that everyone may have a BlackBerry doesn't mean, therefore mean that the risk of, of conflict has disappeared, but it, uh, it does help perhaps to ensure that you might have at least an avenue of communication ready. So I think that's a, a very good point. And the extent to which the South American president's informal network can be extended to other parts of the world is a good thing. Good. Um, well, we're a couple of minutes behind. I hope you'll, you'll forgive us. One of the things that John Park said was that a big job now among people is the question, as he put it, of de-conflicting plans. So I'm going to de-conflict your plans for lunch, um, which is that um, all the speakers and panelists, everyone who's on a, on a panel, if you would just sort of gravitate over here, we're going to follow Mr. Kleiss. For everyone else, lunch is outside through those glass doors. Um, you're welcome to eat there, welcome to eat here. Uh, and the second panel will reconvene at 1.15, please, 1.15. So if you would join me, first of all, in thanking USIP, and then thank the panel. <laughs> you did a wonderful, wonderful job. You did a great job.